Now we've been studying the life of Joseph, so let's get a context of where we've been, because this, this chapter that we're going to cover now is a major chapter in the, st- in the story, in his narrative, and uh, his whole life. So let's look at the story arc so far. We were introduced to him back in chapter 30 and 33 of Genesis, where uh, we saw the birth in his early childhood when he was seven years old, and he, he was projected in the narrative as being the, the promised child, uh, the one through whom God's covenant would go through. He would be the one uh, that everything would uh, be given to as far as an heir. Uh, then we skip all the way until he's 17, 10 years later, uh, where he is also viewed as being the promised child or the favored child. He's the one who is receiving the uh, uh, favor of his father, and he was being set up to be the next heir, even though he had other brothers that were older than, than him. Uh, and he was given a coat which showed his authority in his position. Uh, that didn't go well with him, with his brothers. Out of jealousy and hatred, they, they sold him into slavery where he was then taken to Egypt. So we see in the first story arc, we saw uh, his rise into position of power uh, or authority or honor. And that was based because he was an honorable, faithful man to uh, his father. Uh, but then out of evil, He was punished, unjustly punished, and taken to uh, Egypt. In Egypt, he was sold to a house of Potiphar, uh, where he's he's lived from the age of 17 until some unknown time, but it was a few years. Uh, And there also, because of his faithfulness and his character, he was given grace by God and also elevated into a position of authority. He went from being in the fields to being in in a house servant, from house servant to being a steward over over all of Potiphar's uh, estate. And Potiphar is the chief bodyguard uh, in in Egypt to Pharaoh. So he had a major estate. Uh, But then also, during that time, his wife, Potiphar's wife, who was uh, wicked, accused Joseph, and he was put into jail, into prison. Uh, the prison that Potiphar had uh, was over. Uh, so we see the same kind of story arc going again. And then we're introduced to a third pr- house, which is a prison house. In Hebrew, it's very specific. It's a prison house. Uh, it's giving that play from Jacob's house, Potiphar's house, now a prison house, uh, where he's in there for many years. Again, God gives him grace, uh, his faithfulness, and his responsibility is rises him in the in the ranks within the prison, and the chief jailer puts him in charge of everything of all the prisoners. Uh, so he's in a position of authority. And then we are introduced uh, in chapter forty to these two new inmates, and that was last week, a cupbearer and a baker. And they had dreams, and he interpreted the dreams, but e- even though God gave him the interpretation, and we, we saw all these things happening, these details happening, and God bringing together, this is how he's going to get out of prison. Uh, but then we learned at the end of the chapter that he was forgotten by the cupbearer, who would be in front of Pharaoh. Pharaoh being the only one that could get him out. Uh, so that's where we were, we were left. We were left by, in the text, in the narrative, leads us to the question of, okay, the cupbearer forgot him. Has God forgotten? Uh, in these, these chapters, we were seeing the faithful, his faithfulness to God and his subsequent character, his elevations and positions of trust and authority, and then some evil force comes in and mistreats or falsely accuses Joseph and takes that position away. And then Joseph is sent into a new house. We, we saw that over and over. Now this week, we're going to read about our final house, which is the house of Pharaoh. And this is part one, and it's going to be the rise of, of Joseph. Uh, chapter 41, verses 1 through 45. And this week, we're going to look at three scenes within this narrative, uh, where Joseph rises in authority and honor in the house of Pharaoh. Uh, the first scene recorded is Pharaoh's dream. This is 41, 1 through 7. And when this, uh, this scene at nighttime in Pharaoh's chamber, he has two dreams. So the first dream is in verses 1 through 4. Uh, one starts off by saying, and, it, and now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. Now two full years, that's referring back to the time when Joseph interpreted the previous dreams. Uh, of the baker and the cupbearer. So that would be, mean that this time period is, again, Pharaoh's birthday, uh, two years later. And uh, it's two years from the time when he was forgotten, uh, being in, a, in the ho- horrific conditions of being imprisoned, uh, still a slave, has some authority within it, but still not great conditions, not especially one who was promised of God to be one of authority, where even his mother and his brothers would all bow down. 
So the text tells us that uh, Pharaoh had a dream. It never tells us which Pharaoh it is. Uh, so which Pharaoh is it? It is Sesostris II, which is also known as Senusaret II. Uh, these are some uh, statues of him. And uh, this is his pyramid. Uh, this is the time frame of when he's lived. And he's the one that's having the dream and the one in whom Joseph is going to uh, interact with. Uh, later on, uh, because of the timing, Joseph is also going to interact with his, his son, which is going to be Sinus uh, Suret III. Uh, but going back to the text, uh, notice the text doesn't tell us his name because that's not important. We want to keep the focus on God's people and what he's doing within his people, even in a foreign nation. So the text doesn't mention his name. It's just focused on Joseph. Uh, so the text goes back in verse 1. It continues by giving us vivid language uh, to us concerning his dream. It says, And behold, he was standing by the Nile. And lo, from the Nile there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, uh, and they grazed in marsh grass. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and, ta and gaunt. And they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. Then Pharaoh awoke. So he's standing in his dream, he's standing by the Nile. We need to remember the Nile is the source of life of all of Egypt. It was deified. It was where they got all their, their food, water, transportation, mud for bricks, houses, everything came from the Nile. Uh, so this dream, starting off by the Nile, it's directly associated with life itself. And out of the Nile, literally out of the Nile, came seven cows. Now cows were known to almost be completely submerged in the water. It, it helped them with flies and to, and to uh, ward off the heat uh, in, in Egypt. And this is a, a normal scene. Sleek means, literally in Hebrew, it means beautiful cows. And fat cows just mean they're, they're healthy. They're what a cow should be. It's a normal scene. Then that is followed up by seven other cows uh, that were ugly and, and gaunt. You notice the sleek or beautiful and ugly. It's contrasted. And then fat is contrasted with gaunt, which means thin or bony cows. Uh, and the bony cows stood right next to the fat cows. So it was easily that Pharaoh can, can see the, and compare them and contrast them. And it was a huge contrast. And it was probably a little, uh, a little unnerving to see the sight of these two together. Uh, and because it is dream they're standing together, it's natural to ask, okay, how do they relate to one another? And then, all of a sudden, the ugly ones, or the thin ones, they ate the cows. That would be quite, it, it sounds funny, but it would be horrific uh, if you were there in a dream. Uh, it would probably be quite, be quite graphic. Uh, in a gruesome sight, uh, there would be piercing sounds and screams of cows being slaughtered. Uh, blood everywhere. It was everything needed for a great nightmare. And that's what happened. It woke him up. Uh, and then he had a second dream. Uh, the text says, and he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. Uh, and behold, seven ears of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. And then behold, seven ears, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven plump and full ears. Uh, then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So this talks about, uh, about grain. Grain is a staple food in Egypt, in their agricultural life. And it, this is saying it had seven ears from one stalk. Now if you look at the, the, uh, the stalks here, this is wheat. If you see the stalk, how many, how many heads of grain are there on one stalk? There are one. So for this dream to have seven heads on one stalk, it's showing it's abundantly, unusually plentiful. It's a lot. Uh, it's, the grain is plump, uh, meaning fat, and good. It's just saying this is the ideal crop. It's, it's beautiful. It's perfect. And then the second one is thin and scorched. The idea of scorch is just dried out. It's dehydrated. It's, it's just thin. And it was dried out by the east wind. Now that's a figure of speech. It became a figure of speech to mean a hot air that's coming from a desert. Uh, and now in, uh, that blew in and it literally just sucked all the moisture out of plants. It would, it would kill and, w and wither plants uh, in a very rapid pace. Uh, in, in Egypt, it's known specifically as the uh, Kamsin wind. 
and that actually comes from the south southeast uh, direction. Uh, but the east wind just became a figure of speech in this region because towards the east of Palestine and Egypt, it's all desert. Uh, and so that grain, which is dried up and scorched, it, the text says it swallowed or gulped up the other ones. Uh, and uh, that scene as well, I don't know if it was loud or how, how grain can swallow up another. Uh, this is a dream. But that also jolted Pharaoh up and he woke up. He had a second nightmare. Uh, and that brings us to the second scene. The second scene is in his throne room where he, he received his wise men, his guests, uh, the other people in his court where he wants to know the interpretation of that dream. And so in the second scene is the lack of its interpretation in chapter 41 verses 8 through 13. And first, in verse 8, we see the inability of the uh, Egyptian experts. Verse 8 says, And now in the morning his spirit was troubled. Uh, so he was upset and literally disturbed by his dream. You know, we have to ask, why is that the case? Why was he so disturbed about that kind of dream? We need to remember that dreams in this time period were considered to be communications from divine beings. From In Pharaoh's context, it's the gods of Egypt. He is Pharaoh, which means that he is considered to be divine or uh, born from a divine being and he was the mediator between the gods and his people. So if they were trying to communicate to him, it was very important that he understand it. Uh, and uh, further, those dreams were quite difficult, scary, troubling. So if the gods were communicating something to him that was troubling, he needed to figure it out. Uh, and, he, and he was responsible for that. And for him being troubled, it means he, he didn't know what it meant. He didn't know how to apply it. Further, in Egyptian mythology, a cow, that actually uh, signifies or is represented by the goddess uh, Hathor. Uh, you can see her here. She has the cow horns here uh, and the sun disk here. She's the daughter of Ra. Uh, here it's, here's a, she's in her cow form with the same headdress. Sometimes it's just her head with cow ears. She's a goddess of, of women, of love, of beauty, of pleasure, of music. Uh, so, uh, and she was once sent by Ra, who is her father, uh, in their mythology to punish humanity. And she, she enjoyed it so much that she went overboard and started killing everyone. And Ra had to step in and stop her. So, just think about the connotations here. Uh, if they're showing a, a dream of a cow, is that mythology going to happen again? Is this people going to be in trouble? Is she coming back to, to judge the people? Uh, you can see where she, uh, he would be quite upset about it. And then secondly, uh, this god over here is Osiris, which is a god of vegetation. And he's linked with growing crops which would, he would, Pharaoh would naturally associate it with grains. Uh, and he was thought to be one of the first pharaohs of Egypt who brought civilization to humanity. Uh, in their mythology, his brother Seth killed him, but then his wife of Osiris r resurrected him and put him back together, and he became the god of the underworld and the judge of the dead. So you see, not really two great characters to be associated with in a dream. Uh, so in, in his mind, it could be that his whole nation is, is being threatened. Uh, and he didn't understand what this meant, what they were trying to communicate. Uh, so in, in contrast, though, to the, the cupbearer and the baker who were in prison who had no access to any of the experts, Pharaoh had all the resources of Egypt at his disposal. So he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And the Pharaoh told them his dreams. But, they were not, no, uh, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. The word for magicians here in Egypt, it's talking about a particular kind of priest who were experts in handling these uh, ritual books of the priests, their craft and their magic. Uh, remember we talked about dream books in Egypt. They would write down these dreams and what they represented. And so they'd be looking at this literature, pouring over it, trying to find the symbols, what they meant so they can interpret his dream. And then he also called in all the wise men. So all of the knowledge, all of the wisdom of Egypt are right here at his disposal. Uh, so these are the best of the best. And they can't do it. They can't interpret it. They're having difficulties. 
Now, why are they having difficulties? Especially they have these books. Well, one, one scholar has suggested, and I think he's probably accurate, uh, in here in Hebrew, this word here, dreams, is actually singular. It's dream. I think Pharaoh know, knew that these two dreams were communicating the same thing. Uh, but then the uh, wise men, there was no one that could interpret them. This in Hebrew is plural. So it seems like Pharaoh says, okay, these two dreams are saying the same thing. But then when the experts went to go consult their books and their codes, this means this, this means this, those two dreams wouldn't correspond. They wouldn't correlate. They weren't harmonizing. That's probably what's happening, the case. And so they couldn't give a definitive answer to Pharaoh. Uh, because if it was just one dream, they should be able to use their symbols and their charts and their ciphers and their books to, to give them something, some kind of story. So this lack of understanding just caused a greater anxiety uh, and desperation in Pharaoh. And the unresolved problem caused the, the cupbearer to think of in remembrance of Joseph, verses 9 through 13. So the, uh, verse 9 starts and says, Then the chief cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh and said, I would make m mention today of my own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants, and he put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief baker. We had a dream on the same night, he and I, each of us dreaming according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now, a Hebrew youth was with us there, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related them to him, and he interpreted our dream for us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream. And just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. All right, so going back up, uh, the cupbearer says, uh, I would make mention today of my offenses. That's referring to, number one, his earlier sins against Pharaoh, which landed him in prison. And then kind of in the background, number two, that he forgot about Joseph. He forgot to uh, relay good words about Joseph before Pharaoh. Uh, so then here he's, he's talking about Pharaoh, uh, Joseph. And notice in verse 12 how he identifies Joseph. He's a Hebrew youth. Now at this stage, Joseph is 30. He's 30 years old, and yet he's considered a youth. Uh, and he's a Hebrew, he's a foreigner. Uh, and thus he's one who worshiped Yahweh alone. Uh, and he's seen as a servant, literally a slave, of the, uh, the captain of the bodyguard, which refers to Potiphar. Uh, and so, uh, notice, Joseph is seen as being one of the most unlikely people that can interpret this dream. He, he's not an expert, he's not a magician, he's a foreigner who's a slave in prison, and a youth. Uh, so, here in this, these verses, the cupbearer relates his personal experience, and the cupbearer has so much faith in Joseph that he recommends Joseph to Pharaoh. Now remember, if Joseph doesn't deliver and doesn't interpret uh, correctly for Pharaoh, not only is Joseph in trouble, but the cupbearer who recommended him would also be in trouble. So the cupbearer is, is really confident in Joseph, or at least enough to recommend him and put his life on it, uh, or going back to prison again, um, is in front here. That brings us to a third scene. The third scene is the, the rising of Joseph. And it's the rest of our passage, verses 14 through uh, 45. Uh, in the first section there, we see Joseph is summoned to hear Pharaoh's dream. Uh, in verses 14 through 24. And that begins with Pharaoh, uh, Joseph's humbly standing before Pharaoh. Verse 14 says, Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph. And they hurried, hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And, then he, he, and when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. Uh, notice that they hurriedly, they did this as fast as they can, and Pharaoh was that desperate, that uneasy. Uh, they didn't, he didn't have peace. They needed to do it as fast as they could. And uh, the question there is, in, in the text it's implied is, okay, if the experts of Egypt couldn't do it, can really a slave do it, a, a youth? Uh, so that, that's, that's continually being brought up here. And notice it says that they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon, Remember that word for dungeon also means pit in Hebrew. So here it's that, just like we saw when he was in Canaan, where his brothers put him in a pit and he had to be raised up, here as well, he's in the dungeon in the pit and he's being raised up, uh, brought out. And they, they, shaved, him, uh, they shaved him. Uh, this is an ancient razor, something which they probably would use something like that. Uh, in Egypt, 
almost everyone didn't have hair. Uh, they, they shaved it because of lice. Uh, so just for comfort, and especially if you're going in, in the presence of, of the king, you weren't going to bring any of that in. So they basically were giving him a quick shave to clean him and make sure he was free. They changed his clothes. That is a symbolic act, as we've seen in the other narratives. Uh, it shows that his circumstances are about to change. His prison clothes are off, and he's going into a new, new circumstances. So reading on in verse 15, it says, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, uh, but... No one can interpret it. And I heard it said about you that when you he hear a dream, you can interpret it. And notice the whole direction of Pharaoh's communication is you are an expert. You have the wisdom. You have the ability in you. And look how, in verse 16, how Joseph answers. Joseph said to Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Joseph doesn't take credit. Uh, for God's work in his life. But he points Pharaoh to God. Now, Joseph is known as being a Hebrew. He's already been introduced that way, and surely he was introduced that way to, to Pharaoh. So when he says that God would give it, it's, he's referring to Yahweh, the, the God that I worship. Yahweh, he will give you the uh, favorable answer. Uh, and thus, that would be a testimony. Joseph is giving a testimony to God. And when it says favorable answer there, it's not something that Pharaoh wants to hear. It's not necessarily the interpretation is, oh, oh lollipops and, and great things and gumdrops. It, it means, it doesn't necessarily mean a positive interpretation, but it's something that will satisfy Pharaoh, that will calm his spirits and give him, give him that peace he's looking for, that, okay, I know what they're trying to communicate. The next section is Pharaoh relays that dream to him. Verse 17 through 23. Where it says, So Pharaoh spoke to Joseph. In my dream, behold, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, and behold, seven cows, fat and sleek, came up out of the Nile, and they grazed in the marsh grass. Lo, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gone, such as I had never seen for ugliness in all the land of Egypt. And the lean and ugly cows ate up the, f the first seven cows, yet when they had devoured them, it could not be uh, detected that they had devoured them, for they were just as ugly as before. Then I woke, then I awoke. Uh, I saw also in my dream, behold, seven ears, full and good, came up on one single stalk, and lo, seven ears, withered, thin, and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them, and the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. Uh, then I told it to the magicians, but uh, there was no one who could explain it to me. This is almost identical to the previous, except for you can see in Pharaoh's words a little more color, a little more emotion. Uh, he's saying that these are really poor and really ugly, and uh, I've never seen such ugly cows in all of Egypt. So he's really kind of giving extremes uh, to give Joseph an idea of what he's, what he's seeing. Uh, and really that's the only new information. Uh, and so then, the next section here, we see Joseph interprets a dream for Pharaoh. Verses 25 through 36. And first, uh, Joseph interprets the dream. Um, in verse 25 to 27, it says, Now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has t uh, told Pharaoh that he, what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years, and the dreams are one and the same. Uh, the seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years uh, the seven thin ears scorched by the east wind are, uh, will be seven years of famine. Okay, so there are three parts to this interpretation that he gives. Number one, uh, these two dreams refer to the same message. It's kind of what Pharaoh has been saying, I think, and the uh, magicians couldn't figure it out. Uh, number two, the message refers to the future. And usually dreams w communicated what was going to happen. Uh, and then number three, the third thing he, he tells them is that the seven refers to seven good years uh, that are going to be followed by seven bad years or famine years. Next, Joseph explains what the divine message uh, means to him. How, how is it going to apply to Egypt uh, in verses 28 through 32? Uh, so the first part, he, in, he interprets the divine message. And then now he's applying the divine message. But he says, uh, it is as 
I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt. And after them, seven years of famine will come. And all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine will ravage the land. So the abundance will be unknown in the land because of that subsequent famine. For it will be very severe. Now, as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God, and God will quickly bring it about. And notice the emphasis here on, on the immediacy uh, of these dreams, the fulfillment of them. Uh, there's there's going to be a future abundance, and then after that, seven years of a famine. That's going to happen immediately. God has determined it. Uh, it is predestined. It was going to happen, period. Uh, uh, and, and God's going to bring it about. So after Joseph applies, he, he told Pharaoh what it means, what the, the symbols are, what, what the text is communicating, then how it's going to apply to his situation, Joseph goes a step further and gives recommendations. He calls from and urges and exhorts him to do certain things based on the divine revelation. The, based on what God has communicated, what is going to happen, what's prede predetermined to happen. So here he, he exhorts Pharaoh uh, to, to act. And he says, Now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Discerning means intelligent and having understanding. And wise is, means it's associated with uh, experience and skill. It's having wisdom. Uh, and let him oversee... Uh, the land of Egypt, over the, all, all the land, and let Pharaoh uh, take action and appoint overseers in charge of the land. Uh, overseers would be uh, rulers over each city that are all under that one overseer. Uh, so they can implement this plan over the whole land of Egypt. Uh, and let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. It's basically saying put a 20% tax on, on the grains and on the foods uh, so we can uh, bring it in. So remember, this is not a normal year of produce. This is going to be an abundance. Uh, so taking that extra 20% out is not going to hurt them. It's not going to hurt anyone. In fact, they're probably going to still have an abundant crop even after that, that huge tax. Verse 35, uh, Then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. Now, that's interesting. Uh, the overseers are over the cities. They're going to put it together in certain silos or storage bins and they're supposed to guard them. Why would they guard them? Uh, because Joseph knows the wickedness of man and the laziness of man. If you've had two or three years of a in crops and you see all this grain here that could last you for years, do you really want to go out in the field and work more? <laughs> and people might take it by force, but or just go in and try to take it. And so they're under guard. Uh, so that can't happen. Uh, it forces people to keep working. Uh, so the abundance would cause laziness. And then when the famine started, uh, that would cause desperation and crime. Uh, so the, the grain is being protected uh, at all costs. And he says here, let, um, 36, let the food become as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which will occur in the land of Egypt, so that the land will not perish during the famine. Now that phrase in Hebrew, shall not perish, it literally means to be cut off, or to be, to be destroyed, exterminated, cut off from the land of the living. So this famine is that serious uh, that it could end most of the nation of, e of Egypt as a superpower. Now, in that day, Egypt here is the superpower of the world. They are the greatest nation. Uh, so here, although there's strong predestination, God is doing this, and he's going to do it quickly. There's also a strong call for action. Joseph uh, is saying, Pharaoh, you need to do this. You need to take action so that you can get through this. And thus, by taking action, he's having faith in God's revelation, his words. Now notice in, in this text here, it says, let Pharaoh look for a man. He's not saying, hey, look for a man, Pharaoh. And I'm the guy. No, he's, he's humble about it. He's basically saying, 
I don't have the discernment or wisdom to do it. You, you need to, there, there's so many other people that are wiser than I am. You, you find someone uh, to do this task. Uh, and unknowingly, Joseph, by giving the rest of his recommendations, is really putting in his resume. Uh, and uh, these recommendations in them, it shows Joseph's wisdom, his understanding, and his experience that he's gained from being that slave at Potiphar's house and how things are run and how to, how to run and what a, a normal, typical household in Egypt needed, uh, both in the farm and inside. Uh, so God had used his past, although it wasn't pleasant, he used him to give him the experiences that he needed for this time. So this is followed by the final section, which is uh, Joseph is placed over Pharaoh's house uh, in verses 37 through 45. And first we see the agreement among Pharaoh's court. Uh, so in part A, we saw Joseph was raised up from the dungeon, from the pit. In part B, we saw the future is, uh, is raised before Pharaoh. Uh, and now we're seeing Joseph, Joseph is being raised up in the house of Pharaoh. Verse 37 says, Now the uh, proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his servants. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom a, a divine spirit? So basically what Pharaoh's saying is everyone agreed what Joseph was proposing was the best course of action. Uh, and it's coming from a youth, a slave, a Hebrew. And then Pharaoh adds to it, uh, can we find uh, a man like this, what Joseph is proposing, which is, r looks a lot like him, in whom is a divine spirit? Uh, Pharaoh sees something different in Joseph. He, he, he sees that Joseph has that interpretation, but there's more to it than just that. He, he, he sees that God is truly with him. Uh, and although in Pharaoh's eyes, uh, when he says a divine spirit, he's thinking one of many. Uh, that's just the God of the Hebrews. Uh, but he sees something different. He sees something supernatural in Joseph. And what's the result? The result is that Joseph is appointed by Pharaoh as the second over Egypt. And really, that is the wisest thing Pharaoh could have done. If God gave the interpretation to Joseph, and Joseph has wisdom in the favor of God, which Pharaoh is, is, is seeing, who better? I mean, Potiphar learned that really quickly. He put Joseph over all his house, and his house was blessed. The jailer learned that quickly. He put everything over under Joseph's control. Now Pharaoh's doing the same thing. It's interesting that these three different houses in pagan, uh, non-believing communities saw something different in God's Man, in someone that's faithful, someone that's godly. They saw a character uh, that, that all of humanity admires uh, as wise and as, as good. Okay, so let's see what this means. Uh, in verse 39 it says, So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has informed you of all this, there's no one who discerns, uh, is, is so discerning and wise as you are. There he is. He repeats Joseph's words back to him. Uh, there's no one that is discerning and wise. That's exactly what Joseph said in verse 33. Uh, so uh, God is the one who gave Joseph that dis discernment and that wisdom. And there's no one else better than, than Joseph to lead. So here, think about to the original readers who are the Jewish people whom Moses is writing to in the wilderness who used to be slaves who are coming out in the wilderness. Uh, Joseph is an individual of the lowest status. He was a slave, he was a youth, but he put his faith in God and he's following Yahweh and that's shown in his life. And he is declared by the, the ruler of the most powerful nation to be wiser and more discerning than anyone in his kingdom. Uh, think about that and it's just because Joseph had faith in God, and God gave favor to Joseph. What an encouragement that would be to any of the Hebrews writing it. And what an encouragement it is to us who's reading it. We as believers as well in, in Jesus, uh, in Yahweh, are ones, because wisdom begins with the fear of God, we have wisdom. Uh, it, it is there for us. Okay, so what does he say? In verse 40 it says, You shall be over my house. And according to your command, 
all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. That phrase to do homage there is very interesting in Hebrew. Uh, it literally means upon implication, your words of your mouth, all my people will kiss the ground in submission. Uh, they will follow it exactly. It's very interesting, colorful language. It's probably a figure of speech here that he's using uh, to communicate that everyone will obey your words, anything that comes out of your mouth. And notice he says, you shall be over my house. And then in verse 41, it says, Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. My house is over, is, is the land of Egypt. So here we have that important phrase that we, we've been waiting for that's repeated throughout the narrative. Joseph is now over the house of Pharaoh, uh, the largest, greatest nation of the world. Uh, this would mean that he was over all the government activities were under his control, the treasury, the uh, judiciary, the police, the army, the navy, agriculture, everything. And this was known as... It, in ancient Egypt as the uh, visery. Uh, that was the title of someone that was given this position. Uh, Joseph's not the only one. There are other ones throughout history that have been given this position, uh, but it's well known. So this is the fourth time now that Joseph was raised to a position of honor and authority in a house. And we know from the previous story that the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. So because of that, we know here that it's not just Pharaoh looking kindly at him, but it's God granting him favor with Pharaoh. So we can see that it is God who is giving Joseph favor in the sight of Pharaoh. And uh, how would Pharaoh demonstrate that to Joseph? Uh, how would he demonstrate that over the rest of the land? He continues in verse 42, he says, Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring uh, from his hand and put it on uh, Joseph's hand. Uh, what you're looking at here is a, uh, the signet ring of the 18th dynasty Pharaoh, uh, where you would see his birth name here, and then this is his royal title, which literally is, says son of Ra. Uh, and, but... What Joseph's wearing would have this seal. This seal here is actually the seal of Sesostris II. And it was used, the signet ring was used to stamp or seal official documents as commands or laws as if they're coming from Pharaoh himself. So here, Joseph is given written authority to send out throughout the nation. Okay, number two, and clothe him in garments of fine linen and put uh, the gold necklace around his neck. A fine linen uh, it refers to top quality Egyptian linen. It was white, it was soft, and it was almost transparent. Uh, this is a later picture of Pharaoh. This is actually Ramses III, which is much later, but you get the idea of the linen here. It's white and it's, it's transparent, soft. This is not something that normal people could afford. Uh, this was for the wealthy. And in fact, in Pharaoh's court, in general, they wore this clothing. So again, in our story of Joseph, we see something special about his clothing, his coat. He has a new coat. Uh, and then a gold necklace. And it's not a necklace that we normally think of. It actually refers to a collar. You can see this here. That's why I have this picture here. It's a, a collar. Uh, this is actually a necklace that was found in uh, Sesostris II's uh, pyramid that is from him, from his kingdom. You can just see the artwork there and the beauty. Uh, but Joseph would be giving a, a gold necklace or a collar that signified both wealth and authority. Uh, of the Pharaoh. You think about it, with his linen and his, his necklace, he's looking like Pharaoh himself. Because, and it shows Joseph's status, his rank, and his office. Then, it says, he had him ride in his second chariot, and they proclaimed before him, bow the knee, or literally kneel. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Uh, the chariots were the quickest mode of transportation, uh, and they were far more elaborate than normal chariots, which again showed him his position over the nation. And Pharaoh commanded uh, someone to yell out uh, as a herald, uh, to bow the knee before Joseph. It shows honor. Uh, Pharaoh is forcing the whole nation to show Joseph honor. Uh, and 
in these words to Neil, we see a strange echo to Joseph's dream earlier where the stars and the moon and the grains bow down to him. So it's starting to foreshadow what's about to happen, those dreams being fulfilled. So now the last phrase, notice there, uh, and let him over, uh, and set him over the land of Egypt. That's a repetition from what Pharaoh said. See, I've set over the land of Egypt. This is how he is setting Joseph over the land of Egypt. It's showing how Pharaoh is demonstrating that. Uh, and what this is saying, saying and showing us in the text is, look at the power of God over circumstances. You, you know, one day he is a slave in a prison. And the next day... He is the second in command over the largest nation of the, of the world. Uh, and it's communicating. We don't, and that, mind you, that also happened two years after where God initially had started working. Uh, we don't know how the choices we make today will be used by God's plan for tomorrow. Uh, what God has called us to do is to be faithful uh, and to obey Him, seek Him, love Him. Uh, he has called us uh, to do that because it's only through righteousness that he can bring about peace and life and restoration. Uh, if we're in disobedience, rebellion, and sin, that's only going to bring damage, destruction, and harm. Uh, so this is how Pharaoh demonstrated Joseph to be over his land. But wait, there's more. Verse 44 says, Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall rise his hand or foot in all of Egypt. So here, Pharaoh is giving Joseph virtually unlimited power. Verse 45, Then, Joseph, uh, then Pharaoh uh, named Joseph Zaphenoth Peniah, and he gave him Aseneth, the daughter of Potipharah, uh, the priest of On, as his wife. And Joseph went forth over the land of Egypt. Now he changed his name. He gave him an Egyptian name kind of completing his transformation in, into the Egyptian culture. And that name is uncertain as far as scholars. It's debated as far as what that name actually means. Uh, there's one of three good suggestions. One is that God has spoken and he will live. The second one is God speaks and lives. And the third one is the man he knows. Basically the idea of he, he's, to him has been revealed mysteries. And the ancients, uh, the ancient translations take that third, the, the third, but most popular with scholars is the first. Um, but what we see here in the renaming is that uh, it's, Joseph is becoming more like an Egyptian uh, in, in appearance, and he's assimilating. And he's doing so, so he, that he'd be accepted in the court and by the Egyptian people in general. And he does it without qualms, without problems. He does it to minister, to save the people's lives, to do good. And it, this is the work that God has, has set him up to do. And then Pharaoh marries him into a prominent family, a priest uh, f uh, of On. The daughter, his daughter's name, Aseneth. That means she belongs to the goddess Neit, uh, which is pictured on the side there. She is the goddess of war, of hunting, and of wisdom. You see maybe possible connection. Uh, this is a shield, and these are supposed to be arrows. She holds uh, an onks, which is a sign of life. And this staff is a ruling staff. So she, she is so associated with rule and life itself, uh, wisdom, war. You can see how all that is connected with the idea of Joseph. But, uh, and her father is uh, Potiphera. It sounds a lot like Potiphar. It comes from the same root. Again, it means uh, he whom Ra has given. And he's a priest of On. Now that, that city you know by a different name. It's uh, Hierapolis. Uh, that city here, it's here. On, it's where the major temple of, the, of Ra worship was. And that Ra is a sun god. Uh, the Greeks later renamed On Hierapolis. Hier means sun. Opolis is city. City of the sun. Uh, so here, to, to, for Joseph to be married, he'll be connected socially, to the most power, one of the most powerful families in Egypt. Uh, and that completes his, all the favors and all the blessings that God has given him in position, in, in character. And that, with all of that, the question that we have to ask is, okay, Joseph is, went forth over the land of Egypt. 
How is he going to use that newfound power? How is he going to use that new authority? We've seen him in, in other places being faithful. Will he continue to be faithful? He accepts and assimilates in the Egyptian culture. Uh, and so far, he has been faithful to God. Uh, so will he do that the same? And that is uh, the conclusion of the uh, part one of, of the, the rise of Joseph. So let's look at applications. Uh, number one, God worked through Pharaoh's dreams and connected them with the events that happened two years ago to bring Joseph out of the dungeon or slash pit. God grants Joseph Pharaoh's favor and Joseph rises to second in command over uh, the whole of Egypt, the world's most powerful nation at the time. We don't know how the choices we make today will be used in God's plan for tomorrow. However, we do know that he has called us to be faithful to him because only righteousness uh, can bring life, peace, and restoration. Number two, the text purposely contrasts the inability of the greatest and wisest men of the whole nation of Egypt with the insight of a Hebrew slave, a youth with whom God's spirit dwelt. All wisdom and knowledge belong to God, and he reveals it to us, to his people. Uh, he has inscripturized it in the Bible. That's why it's so important to read uh, his Bible. It's something we want to do because that's the source of truth, revealed truth. Number three, Joseph does not take credit for the things he has done, uh, but he is humble and points Pharaoh to God. Joseph also demonstrates humility in his recommendation to Pharaoh to find someone with discernment and wisdom, not thinking of himself as a candidate. Based on his interactions, Pharaoh attests that he can see the Spirit of God on Joseph. Joseph did not hide his light under a bushel, but his life showed humility and open dependence on God. Number four, the pattern Joseph displays in dealing with God's revelation is to interpret the message, to apply the message, and then to make the appropriate plans concerning the message. This is still the proper way to interpret God's word. In interpreting what does it mean? What is it saying? Uh, why is he saying it? How, how does this apply to life? And then how can I change? What do I need to change in order to, to become more like God? And then finally, number five, Joseph assimilates to, into G Egyptian culture without sinning against God uh, to be accepted and to help the people of, uh, of Egypt live. He is given great honor, power, and authority, which he accepts. And the question we must ask of the future pages in Genesis is, how will he use his new position?